ビデオ What do we learn when we analyze the works of an artist? When you look closely at the successful works of a creator, you try to learn what made them so successful in the first place. When people look at an influential piece of literature, they try to guess if it had something to do with how an author structured their story or wrote their sentences. When people look at a critically lauded film, they examine how a director was able to adapt a screenwriter's screenplay into a captivating work of art. When people look at an animated feature, they break down how the animator used the principles of their craft to make a joke land or to tell an engaging story. Yes, we can learn a lot about what makes an artist great by analyzing their notable works. But sometimes, that's not enough. Sometimes, in order to get the full picture, you gotta analyze their not-so-great creations on their resume. Like in life, you learn just as much of from failure as you do success. Even the great master craftsmen of our time are still fallible human beings and don't always produce gold. And that's fine, bad and even mediocre works produced by otherwise credible artists gives us a full understanding of their skill sets, their limitations, to see how they have evolved or haven't evolved as creators. You learn just as much about Steven Spielberg as a director by watching War of the Worlds in 1941, just as much as you do by watching Jurassic Park and Schindler's List. So I guess what I'm saying is that there is value in watching a piece of crap that, by all accounts, has the name of a very important creator attached to it. And I hope that thesis rings true because otherwise, I wasted my time. <laughs> Okay, so stop me if you've heard this one. A wandering swordsman in feudal Japan, not samurai as he doesn't appear to serve a master or own any land, finds himself entangled in a conflict between shogun nobility and a mysterious clan of ninjas. The swordsman is a composed, rough around the edges loner, who walks his own path and follows his own code of honor. He is also insanely good with a sword. Because of this skill, he is convinced by a group of benefactors to do a job and take on a group of ninjas who have a variety of weird and strange powers. And along the way, he gets entangled in an almost romance with a beautiful woman who has pale white skin, raven hair, and ruby red lips. Also there's blood. And nudity. <laughs> Released at the tail end of 1990, Sword for Truth is an anime that feels like it should have a bit more notoriety attached to it than it actually does. As you may have already guessed from the synopsis above, this was one of the similarly plotted titles that Manga Entertainment localized in an attempt to capture the same audience they did with Ninja Scroll, which is funny because Sword for Truth came out first. But when you look at both titles side by side, it's hard not to think of this anime as nothing more than a shameless mockbuster of the far superior anime that was released three years later. An impression not abetted by Manga Entertainment's marketing constantly saying that it was just as good as Ninja Scroll, just naked attempts to get people to watch this anime by putting the words Ninja Scroll in their minds. But even if the tiniest bit of Ninja Scrolls infamy had rubbed off on it and give it some modicum of reputation, it wouldn't change the fact that Sword for Truth is one of the worst kinds of ultraviolent OVA. Scant budget, incomprehensible storytelling, leaning way too hard on its mature subject matter, and overall being boring beyond compare. Right down to the title, Sword for Truth, what even is that? You almost have to work to conceive a title that bland. I guess the original title of Shironosuke Zanmaken Shi Kamanmon no Otoko, translated to Shironosuke the Demon, Man of the Death Sight's Crest, was a little too exciting for the localization process. But if there's one thing that should give Sword for Truth the token amount of infamy, is the famous name attached to it. Konnichiwa. I've talked about Osama Dezaki in past videos, how he is one of anime's most influential directors, how his techniques have impacted the medium, how he and other animators of his generation helped elevate anime to be this more dramatic art form. Yeah, he directed this anime. The mind and heart behind classics like Ashita no Jo, Rose of Versailles, and Space Adventure Cobra directed this low-budget shock Chanbara title. It's like finding out that James Cameron did Piranha 2 after doing Terminator 2. It doesn't add up at all. 
which is why I'm even covering this anime in the first place. I want to know what Dazaki is doing here. I need to find out what he brings to the table. We need to know what happens when a good director goes bad. Or at the very least takes a bad job in the name of getting a paycheck. Now it would surprise most of you to learn that this is one of the few anime I've come across where the director gave themselves an Alan Smithy. Dazaki asked that he go uncredited as a director and only took a storyboarding credit, which he did so under the alias Sutomo Dazaki. I don't know for sure if that means he was embarrassed to be a part of this turd, but if he really wanted to hide his involvement, the least he could have done was not make his style of directing so obvious. Dazaki's style of direction is all over this anime, and is also perhaps its one saving grace. Despite the anime's budget obviously being slimmer than a Slim Jim, to the point that most of the blood isn't even really colored, Dazaki's direction really makes this anime a lot more visually interesting than it has any right to be. That has been his modus operandi for decades, his ability to hide an anime's limitations through cinematic boarding, shot composition, and editing. For instance, there's the scene where our hero Shironosuke cuts down a vicious white tiger in one slice as a demonstration of his might. And the way it is shown, it feels like Dazaki is giving his own twist to this Kurosawa-styled scene. Dazaki is really doing a lot with very little, and even if the animation is typical of a low budget TV anime, there are a few moments where the key animators are able to stretch their legs and deliver some great dynamic action scenes. They don't come as frequently as they should, but they're there and they do stick around long enough to keep your attention. But enough damning with faint praise, let's damn with strong disapproval. Because aside from Dazaki's direction, this anime is inexcusably bad. To really convey the badness of Sword for Truth just by showing you footage is difficult. It's one of those anime that you really have to watch in full to experience just how poorly made it really is. I think one thing I can do to really sum it all up is to do what I have been doing since the beginning of this video and compare it to Ninja Scroll. Sword for Truth basically is Ninja Scroll. If you remove Ninja Scroll's great animation, tight plot, divine characters, clear motivations, and intricately choreographed fight scenes. Just remove everything that made Ninja Scroll a great anime, and you have Sword for Truth. I am not kidding when I say this anime gave me a newfound appreciation for the video game-like structure of Ninja Scroll. Whereas that allowed for solid structure to course the plot, the way Sword for Truth is plotted feels haphazard and clumsy. This anime was based off an obscure series of books by author Takashi Norumi, who was also the screenplay writer. And I guess I can see how it was adapted from a book because this anime overall feels like a book with vast swaths of pages missing. In a reading of a detailed plot synopsis on CartoonResearch.com by the late anime historian Fred Patton, I was shocked just by how straightforward the plot actually is. There's a princess who gets kidnapped by a group of ninjas who demand her clan's legendary mythic sword as ransom. Shironosuke is hired to take the ransom to them and rescue the princess in exchange for money. He goes to the ninja's hideout, kills the ninjas, and returns the princess to her castle where the clan immediately tries to renege on the deal they made. The princess ends up rescuing Shironosuke and he walks away without the money owed to him. The end. You would think this plot would work well in a 45 minute OVA like this, but Sword for Truth decided to tell this almost overly simplistic story in a way that's completely incomprehensible. The fact that I needed a synopsis at all speaks volumes. One, the editing in this anime is extremely choppy. Scenes don't flow seamlessly from one to the other because they all cut abruptly to the next scene, even when it feels like the scene isn't finished. <laughs> <laughs> Come here! <laughs> It creates this effect where it feels like the plot is happening way too fast, even if nothing of any real plot importance is happening on screen. And that's another thing that compounds Sword for Truth's story. Too many plot points get introduced and go nowhere. Sword for Truth operates under the assumption that the more plot elements you add to a story, the better it will be. But it completely forgets that in order for those story beats to work, 
you need to have them pay off at some point. For example, the whole story appears to revolve around Shironosuke bringing the ninjas this supposedly legendary sword in exchange for the princess. We don't know why this sword is important, or why the ninjas are willing to hold the princess of a powerful clan in direct service to the Shogun captive for it. It's the opposite of Ninja Scroll where a huge part of the story is learning why Genma and his clan of ninjas are a part of this intricate plot to overthrow the Shogun and why they need so much gold to do so. Here, we don't even get as little as a throwaway line about why the ninjas need that sword. It could have been as something as easy as selling it for extra coin, and it would have been acceptable. I'm curious why you should bother going to so much trouble, just to get an old sword. What's so special about it? Perhaps you'd care to explain. It'd be an interesting story. <laughs> I'm afraid they don't tell any stories in hell. And when plot points aren't going anywhere, they are also actively contradicting one another. Right when Shironosuke sets out to deliver the sword, we get this lengthy scene where the princess appears to be hypnotized under the power of opium and lesbian sex. It is time the sword was delivered into the hands of the Seki Ninja. Oh, Princess Mayu, you must bring me the Ginryu sword. Yes, Akuni, I promise. I will. But if they are hypnotizing her to bring the sword to them, why have that scene where we know that Shironosuke is already on the way with his sword? And it doesn't even get followed up on in any meaningful way because the next time we see the princess, she is completely lucid and still being treated like a bargaining chip instead of a Manchurian candidate. So what was the point of this scene? Yeah, figures. And not only does Sword for Truth think adding plot points that go nowhere makes the story better, it also thinks that adding characters that go nowhere also makes the story better. One such character is the lady thief, Oren. That crest on your kimono, the size of death, it's considered very unlucky and is rarely used. A handsome fellow wearing the size of death. It wasn't too hard to find you, Sakaki-san. She's introduced as a character who tries to pickpocket Shironosuke and gets her clothes cut off in return. She later pays him a visit to the hovel he calls home, and asks her some sex, she says that what she truly wants to do is kill him. But Shironosuke is able to subdue her with his penis. Any man who makes love with me must be so cold and full of hate he could kill me at any moment. So, I have to kill you first. Oren. You're not so bad. Heaven and hell can both be found here on Earth. I'll take you to both of them. So it kind of feels like she's going to be a sidekick to Shironosuke, but she is completely left behind after he fights some goons off in his fundoshi and sets off on his mission. So what was the point of her again? Should have known. But at least Oren feels woven into the story, haphazardly as she may be. The most egregious example of utterly pointless supporting cast members being shoehorned into this anime is this cobra-like assassin who kills his targets through martial arts alone. <sighs> Karate, eh? No, jujitsu, actually. Whatever. His scene is completely separate from the current plot going on, and its only point is to set up the final scene of this anime, which itself is only there to set up an, and so the adventure continues ending. The story is already dealing with bad editing and plot cul-de-sacs, it doesn't need a scene jammed right in the middle of everything that's only there to set up an unsatisfying conclusion. And I'm not even getting into the other unresolved points, like the all-female clan of ninjas showing up out of nowhere for one scene, or how the leader of the enemy ninjas clan is introduced as the main antagonist and immediately disappears from the story altogether, or the scene near the end where a mad monk implies that the white tiger slain at the beginning is a sign that a plan or prophecy is beginning to be set in motion. It's the start of a trial by fire. It's a test to see if the Tokugawa will rule for generations or be ground into the dust. Even if his story got its shit together, it still doesn't stop Sword for Truth for being one of the blandest OVAs of its time period. And that can all be pinned on Shironosuke. Being the protagonist, Shironosuke is the one constant that grounds everything in this disorganized anime. So like it or not, you end up focusing on him in order to keep up with everything. But because Shironosuke is tasked with carrying this anime on his shoulders, it doesn't take long to discover just how boring a protagonist he is. He is this perfectly stoic swordsman who approaches everything from deadly sword battles to coitus with the stoniest of faces. 
There's no drama to his battle scenes because he ends them very quickly and barely struggles. An element that made the battles of Ninja Scrolls entertaining aside from the violence was that most battles actually felt like Jubei fighting for his life. He knows that he's punching above his weight class in the fights he's in and has to use every tactic in his arsenal to level the playing field. Shironosuke, on the other hand, makes every battle a total curb stomp. He may as well be filling out paperwork considering how nonplussed he is at cutting a spider ninja in half. I guess what they are trying to do is make Shironosuke this Duke Togo character of the Edo period, this passionless killer for hire who effortlessly carries out his bloodthirsty job as a total power fantasy for the mostly male audience to project themselves onto. Just swap the sniper rifle with the katana. But what makes Duke Togo kinda work is that he has no unnecessary pathos to his character, thus rendering the crux of his stories being mostly about what method he will use to kill his target this time. Sword for Truth, meanwhile, actively tries to give Shironosuke some modicum of depth. Throughout the anime, there's this implication that Shironosuke is grappling internally with PTSD from a past event. That past event being him having to kill his entire family, which included his little brother. You're very kind. Not really a cold-hearted killer at all. I killed both my parents. Then later that evening, I killed my younger brother as well. <gasps> and you know why he killed his family? And why that action obviously caused him to be racked with trauma and guilt over said murder? Your guess is as good as mine because the anime just reveals it and leaves it at that. When the big character twist is that the protagonist slaughtered his entire family, you can't just stop there. You are leaving a lot on the table. You are answering questions by raising further questions. And really, aside from the fact that he murdered his family, we still know very little about who Shironosuke actually is as a character. The only for sure things we do know about him is that 1. He pays rent, 2. He fucks, and 3. He fucks well. Well now, Sakaki-san, I hope you do more with your weapon than just kill tigers. So in the end, Sword for Truth as an anime is unwieldy, unengaging, and uninspired. But this brings us back to the question I had at the beginning. Why exactly did a creative titan of the industry like Osamu Dezaki end up working on this? It's not like Dezaki's career had hit the skids at any point. Throughout the 80s, he had a steady stream of work thanks to his directorial involvement on American Saturday Morning Cartoons, and Sword for Truth's release is just one year removed from Dezaki's own Dear Brother, an anime that is considered by many to be his magnum opus. So what gives? Well, the thing about animation is that it's one of the steadiest jobs one can have in a creative field. If you are part of the animation industry, there is always work coming in. You finish one project and there are more waiting for you right outside your doorstep, provided that you take the projects that are given to you. It's a hard pill to swallow about the animation industry, but industry people will have to take jobs that, while it may be beneath them, it's the only job that's readily available for their skill sets. It's the reason why former co-director of Beauty and the Beast, Kirk Wise, is currently directing this. It's our duty to defend the house. Let's go, team. Yeah! yeah! Bobblehead's the movie, available on DVD and digital December 8th, rated PG. And that's really Occam's katana at play here. Osama Tezaki most likely wound up working on Sword for Truth because it was a job that came to him and he picked it up because bills needed to be paid. And there's also the fact that this anime was produced by Magic Bus, the anime studio known for producing Wounded Man and Mad Bull 34, as well as being run by animator and director Satoshi Tezaki, Osamu Tezaki's younger brother. So yeah, there might also be some connecting tissue there. But whether this was just another gig or a favor called in by a younger sibling is irrelevant. Looking at Sword for Truth with the knowledge of the talent hidden within just makes it worse. You can't help but get the feeling that something terrible happened in production that caused the anime to be what it is. Looking closely, you really see that there was some ambition to be had here, a Kurosawa-styled epic tailor-made for the late night video store crowd. And yet, that didn't happen. It could have been a matter of time, or budget, or interference from the video distributors, but all we know for sure is that Dezaki saw the final product, 
and asked for this anime to be officially stripped from his resume. Sword for Truth tells us that a legendary director with an influential style can only do so much. When a story is this shoddily told, it doesn't matter if you dress it up in elegant layouts, interesting shot compositions, and Akio Sugino's character designs. All you've got is a bad anime that looks like it should have been less bad. But hey, paycheck's a paycheck. Ah, I take it business is going well for you, eh? It's been better.